So taking a look here at the 1920s, um, after World War One, I had left many in the American public feeling exhausted. You know, they were happy that the war was over, but the fact of the debate about joining the League of Nations had really divided the United States at this time. Also, you know, during World War One, we were seeing the tail end of the Progressive Era, and the Progressive Era had caused a lot of change um, amongst American life, some good, some bad, um, and also the economy was starting to change. You know, during World War One, labor unions could not go on strike. Okay, workers could not go on strike because they did not want to disrupt manufacturing of goods and resources for the war effort. So the economy was trying to shift from wartime production back into producing consumer goods. Um, many returning soldiers from World War I were welcomed by their family but were also facing unemployment. Um, or they tried to take their old jobs um, back, which of course is going to force women and many minorities out of a job. With all of these problems also came a rise in cost of living. Um, so many farmers and factory workers were suffering during this time and they were looking for some form of stability. And so this is going to rise um, some new sentiments, some new thoughts within the United States. Um, many Americans responded to the stressful condition by you know, being fearful of outsiders. You know, they thought that a lot of these problems came because they got involved in a foreign war over in Europe. So this is gonna bring about the idea of isolation for the United States to remain just within the United States and only concerned with the US. Um, there's also going to be a wave of nativism again um, because many people felt that foreign born individuals were bringing their ideas to the United States and disrupting the harmony that had been the United States prior to World War I. So there's gonna be some labor unrest. There are going to be many strikes um, as employees are wanting better compensation as the cost of living is going up and the fact that they couldn't go on strike or ask for these changes during the war. So in 1919 we will see some major strikes um, within the steel and the coal industries. Um, but many labor unions are being associated now with the communist movement. We'll talk here in a moment about the rise of communism in the rise of the Soviet Union at the end of World War I. And so many workers who went on strike, they were accused of being radicals, that they were communists or they were socialists or anarchists, people who don't want any form of government. And so those extremes started to paint a negative image of labor unions as a whole. So thinking about the threat of communism, you guys might recall last year from World II, learning about the um, communist, revo uh, the Russian Revolution and the rise of communism and Vladimir Lenin um, within Russia, you know, the rise of the Bolshevik party. And they call for a worldwide revolution to get rid of the evils of capitalism. So a communist party was formed in the United States um, in 1919 and did start to get a lot of the working class to join them. Um, many people started waving you know, the red flag or the communist flag. They got nicknamed um, Reds and this started to scare many citizens within the United States. One such person was the U.S. Attorney General um, A. Mitchell Palmer and he's going to be the one to take on quote the Red Scare. Um, this was a time period when Americans feared um, communism and so Palmer led the Palmer raids. So he, um, along with uh, J. Edgar Hoover, he is going to lead raids into people who were suspected of being anarchists. Um, they trampled people's civil rights. You know, they invaded private homes and offices. They jailed suspects without giving them um, legal counsel. And so hundreds of foreign-born radicals were deported without trial. So this was an infringement on civil liberties here in the United States. And the Palmer raids did not bring up any evidence of any type of revolutionary conspiracies um, or even explosives, okay, um, of people taking some form of radical action. But soon the public decided that um, you know, Palmer was maybe a little too hasty in his attacks and they do start to um, back off of some of the fears there within the Red Scare. In the 1920s, right there in 1920, we will see a new election emerge. Um, so Warren G. Harding is going to defeat James Cox and Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs is on the Socialist uh, candidate and James Cox was of the Democratic Party. So William Harding had a 
campaign message of return to normalcy. Many people wanted to return, not even just you know to times before World War I, but times even before the Progressive Era, when things seemed to be much calmer um, and quieter and relaxed in life. And so he ran on that campaign. He even, people said he, quote, looked presidential um, in his older nature. He was a senator from Ohio. And so he called for those simpler days. Many businessmen are going to like Harding because he wants to get government regulation kind of out of business. So limited government when it comes to um, involvement in people's lives, but primarily involvement in businesses. So he is gonna call for lower taxes. He does implement higher tariffs uh, to try to protect American businesses, particularly um, in chemical engineering and some other forms of business to try to help elevate the American um, companies. And so he, you know, in doing this though, there is going to be some backlash. You know, he's gonna instill the highest tariff that we'll see, uh, 60%, the Fordney um, McCumbrum tariff, raised uh, US imports to 60%, which was the highest level ever. Uh, and again, like I said, this is trying to protect the chemical and metal industries. And this is going to have impact on foreign countries, particularly Great Britain and France, who owe a great deal of money to the United States after World War I. Um, they had two ways to pay that back. They could sell goods in the American economy to try to help pay back their loans, or they were going to have to demand the reparations from Germany so that they got their money to then pay back the United States. With instilling those high tariffs, Great Britain and France aren't going to sell as many products. So this actually in turn put pressure on Germany, who was suffering from inflation at the time, to pay back their um, reparations. And so ultimately the United States actually struck a deal with Germany, help pay off their reparations, give the money to Great Britain and France, who then in turn give that money back to the, to the United States. So essentially we ended up paying our own loans. Um, this is you know, something that we want to do, but it does weaken our relationship with Germany and is going to weaken our relationship for a time with Great Britain and France because they felt the United States did not share in paying their part of, um, of World War I. Um, many European countries felt that they had paid more, so it just creates some tension in regards to our foreign relationships. One thing that is going to be a positive for Harding's administration is the naval disarmament in 1921 to 1922. He was able to get many European countries to agree to um, not build any more warships for 10 years. So he got Great Britain, Japan, France, and Italy all to agree to scrap many of their battleships, cruisers, and aircraft carriers. And so many people thought that, great, this is a step in the right direction. This is where the League of Nations can try to help prevent war, um, that we can demilitarize and disarm many of our um, leading countries to set an example that war obviously was not good for either countries. So while Harding's administration did a great deal for the United States and at home and quote bringing back that normalcy. His administration was also um, had a shadow of scandal that kind of uh, started to overcome some of the positives that he was doing with his administration. Um, he had some great cabinet members. He had Herbert Hoover who was the Secretary of Commerce. He had uh, Charles Hughes as Secretary of State. Um, these, all these men did really good jobs in their positions. Andrew Mellon was one of the country's wealthiest men. He was made Secretary of Treasury and he was able to create drastic uh, cuts in taxes and he reduced the national debt. So he had some really great advisors and cabinet members, but on the other hand, he also had what were nicknamed his Ohio gang. Um, they were his poker playing buddies or cronies and um, there was you know, some scandal that came into their position, which of course is not going to portray Harding in a very positive light. And part of that was the Teapot Dome scandal, um, dealing with government land that was um, oil rich and his um, people kind of taking a cut, taking bribes and selling some of that land to local oil companies for a profit. So those are going to be scandals that hurt the Harding administration. But Harding is going to die while in office. Um, it is believed that he suffered either from a stroke or a heart attack. And so his uh, vice president, Calvin Coolidge, will assume the presidency upon Harding's death. 
some other parts of the 1920s, um, kind of going along with those Palmer raids and the nativist feeling, were the attack on Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, Sacco and Vanzetti were Italian immigrants who were also anarchists, so they did not believe in any form of uh, organized government. So they were charged with murder in 1920, charged of killing a paymaster at a local company and his guard. Um, many people, you know, the Sacco and Vanzetti case made headlines. Um, many people felt Sacco and Vanzetti were being used as examples um, the, the fact that they were foreigners and that they were anarchists, that there wasn't enough evidence to really convict them of the crimes. Um, the supporters claimed that the prosecution and the trial overall was unfair, the judge was uh, biased, uh, mainly because of their background. Ultimately, they were found guilty of the crime of murder. Um, later on, through a, they tried to appeal uh, their case, but still their appeals were denied and they were executed by electric chair in 1927. This is going to lead to protests all around the world that this was an infringement upon their rights, but most of those protests were done by radical groups, so many American citizens did not pay a great deal of attention. Later on, through ballistic testing, it was actually shown that the gun that Sacco had was the same gun that did uh, kill the um, guard and the paymaster, but there's no evidence that it was actually Sacco who fired that gun. Um, so still one of those American mysteries evident today. In the 1920s, we also, with the rise of nativist movement, we will see a reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, they became popular, again, as an advent or avenue in regards to the Red Scare. So they start to broaden. It's not just an attack to try to control the African American population, but starting to target other groups within American society as well. Um, their membership is going to grow exponentially. They're going to reach up to 4.5 million members by 1924. Um, they're going to have campaign slogans uh, opposing prohibition, or, or actually in support of prohibition, but wanting to get rid of alcohol. Um, they oppose unions. They think labor unions were a detriment to business. They also start to attack um, other religions. So uh, Roman Catholics and Jews and anybody who was foreign born, they felt should be expelled or taken out of the United States. Um, many KKK members were paid to recruit new members um, into their world of secret rituals and um, racial violence. So they began to dominate uh, state politics okay, in many states around the United States, not just in the South, but also in Northern and Western states as well. However, their, um, some of their criminal activity is going to lead to a decrease in power eventually. But as you can see in the picture here down in the bottom left corner, um, you can see they're marching there on what is the mall today down in D.C. in front of Capitol Hill. And there were members, there were even congressmen who were members of the Ku Klux Klan. So from 1919 to 1921, there were a number of immigrants had grown by about 600% in the United States. So there were many people who were also calling for a limit on the number of immigrants coming into the U.S. And so a quota act is going to be implemented in 1921, which is going to limit the number of immigrants coming particularly from Southern and Eastern Europe. So places like Italy, Poland, Russia. So kind of catering to some of those native sentiment of wanting to control the immigrant population. So as I said before, uh, William Harding is going to die in office of either a stroke or a heart attack. And so this is going to open the door for his former vice president, Calvin Coolidge, to come into office. Um, Calvin Coolidge was a good fit. Uh, he was a pro-business spirit of the 1920s. Um, he was quoted as saying, the chief business of the American people is business. The man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there worships there. So he's going to continue many of Harding's ideas when it comes to the economy and to business. Um, labor unions overall are going to decrease, but workers' wages are going to naturally start to go up. Um, so he you know, had the nickname kind of Silent Cow because he wasn't as outspoken um, or wasn't, quote, that you know, picturesque president that William Harding had been. 
industries are going to start to boom in the 1920s and one industry that's going to have a huge impact on the united states is going to be the automobile industry um, it's going to change the american landscape uh, considerably because we're going to see the construction of roads more paved roads that are going to be suitable for driving really in all weather types um, you know one of the key roads was route 66 which was a key road from chicago out to uh, california and along this route, we're going to see new little towns pop up um, as people start to make their way west and decide that they're going to stay. Um, the auto industry not only impacted the landscape with road construction, but it's also architectural structure. Many people's houses, you know, um, houses are going to be built with garages or carports because they're going to accommodate people now being able to own an automobile. Um, this is also going to launch, you know, kind of branch out into other areas of industry. You see a picture here of gas stations that are going to need to be built, public garages, repair shops for automobiles. But it also opens up the idea of motels and general travel, tourist camps, shopping centers. People are not going to have to just be in walking distance of the products and things that they buy. So people can start to take vacations and women and young people have a new sense of uh, independence because of the increased mobility that came about from Henry Ford and the manufacturing of the automobile. Uh, looking at 1920s consumers, you know, with the mass production of consumer goods after World War I, um, wages going up, productivity is increasing, which means the price of products are going to start to go down. Uh, with taxes low, people have a lot of money to spend. You know, during World War I, they were encouraged to conserve and save their resources. So the average annual income rose after the war um, by more than 35%. So with this extra income, um, people are looking to buy new products. And so we see the production of new electric products in particular, considering electricity is going to go beyond the urban cities and reach its way out to the suburbs. So instead of, you know, having to wash laundry by a washboard by hand, people started to buy an electric washer. Um, there was also like electric vacuums and uh, simple things like even like a sewing machine or a toaster oven are going to draw people's attention and all these little luxury items just to make life a little bit easier at home. Um, and this is going to have a huge impact on the female population as most women were still um, taking care of the home. This is going to allow them to have a little bit more free time and even in some cases free up women to now actually get a job outside of the home. But most people did not buy these items outright. Um, many people with this money and a steady income felt that they could buy what we call an installment plan. And this was very popular where you put a little money down to begin with and then you make monthly payments while you own the item. Um, and so this was you know, used for people when they bought your know, refrigerators or the electric stove or any of those appliances or products that they wanted for their home um, because they felt secure that they'd be able to make those monthly payments to eventually pay them off. So while we saw like the business change and some of the political changes that took place in the 1920s, we're also now going to focus on some of the social changes um, within the 1920s. So there's a lot that's going to happen socially amongst the public, but also in the role of arts and music and just overall cultural dynamics within the United States. And this is where the 1920s, in some it's called like the age of normalcy when it comes to politics, but here it's kind of referred to as, quote, the roaring 20s. Um, cities start to rise in prominence, you know, with the mobility, with the increase of the automobile between 1922 and 1929, many people are going to leave the rural towns and farms and they're going to start to move closer to the cities, uh, whether it was job opportunities that were there or just the overall excitement. But with this brings about some social change because it becomes almost like a battle between the small town values, okay, and of the rural areas and their moral standards that they had in those areas versus the urban scene and the cultural dynamics of an urban dwelling. And in some cases, people argue perhaps less morals, okay, um, or a different idea of values within the urban city. So in some ways, the 20s became a clash of the small town values versus those big city values and trying to strike a balance between them. One such issue that was brought to light was the teaching of evolution. And so in this case, um, 
there were many fundamentalists in regards to religion who wanted to, you know, kind of keep hold of those small town values and try to keep people um, under the, you know, the traditional ideas and um, ways of the United States prior to World War One. So fundamentalists were skeptical of some of the scientific discoveries and theories that were starting to come about. And they argued that all important knowledge could be found in the Bible. And this is where the theory of evolution comes in. Um, the state of Tennessee in March of 1925 passed the nation's first law that made it a crime to teach evolution. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union promised to defend any teacher who would challenge this law. Well, one such teacher in Tennessee was John Scopes. He decided to teach the theory of evolution in his biology class, which of course violated this Tennessee law. He was arrested, and this is going to bring the circumstances to trial. Um, and his trial was set for July of 1925. So the ACLU is going to hire Clarence Darrow, who is a very famous trial lawyer, to defend Scopes. Um, the prosecution had William Jennings Bryan. Now, William Jennings Bryan had run for president three times on the Democratic uh, ballot, never won, but he was a devout fundamentalist, and so he was brought in as a special prosecutor. Um, this wasn't really a question of whether Scopes was, you know, guilty or not guilty about teaching evolution. He was very open about the fact that he taught evolution. This trial is more about the role of science and religion in public schools. And so the trial started on July 10th, um, 1925, and it was a huge national sensation. It's going to be published in newspapers all over, that they actually had to move the trial outside the courthouse because there were too many people who were trying to observe and watch. Um, the crowd had reached over a thousand to watch Darrow and Brian um, kind of, you know, duke it out. And Darrow, you know, really questioned um, William Jennings Bryan's devotion to the Bible teachings. You know, he questioned their, you know, you know, was there civilization before 4004 BC? Um, does he believe that the earth was truly made in six days? And what got Brian was he says, well, not six days of 24 hours, which many people started to question, you know, Brian's thoughts there. Like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe the Bible doesn't, you know, involve, include everything, you know, that they can't just teach by the Bible. And Brian's, you know, admitted that the Bible could be interpreted in different ways. But ultimately, Scopes was found guilty and had to pay a fine of $100. And the Tennessee Supreme Court later changed the verdict on a technicality, but the law outlawing the teaching of evolution remained in effect for quite some time. Also during the Roaring Twenties was the era of Prohibition. So we talked about the Progressive Era, the temperance movement, um, taking the measures to ban alcohol. And the 18th Amendment uh, prohibited the manufacturing, the selling, and the transportation of alcohol. Note that the law did not outlaw the consumption okay, or drinking of alcohol. It was not illegal to drink alcohol. You just could not make it, you couldn't sell it, and you couldn't manufacture it or transport it back and forth to any places. So, you know, the thought process there is the alcohol supply that is there, when it's gone, it's gone. You can't make more, you can't take it from your house to other places, um, and you can't sell it, you know, in local saloons. So they thought this would be the way to get rid of alcohol because they thought alcohol was the root to all problems. Well, prohibition became extremely difficult to enforce because some people did not want to give it up. And so this is where speakeasies, okay, which were secret saloons, um, started to pop up and they pop up in the most random places. It could be in like the back area of like a local drug store. Um, some of them had like secret codes or secret knocks or, you know, code words to be able to get in, which just heightened people's, you know, want to be able to go to a speakeasy. It was, you know, it's kind of a thrill to, you know, find out who's going to be um, at the speakeasy. They had performers. You might run into a local mobster. Bootleggers were the people who made alcohol and sold it illegally. The government underestimated um, how many people would participate in these criminal acts, and so they did not budget enough money towards prohibition to actually make it effective, to have enough prohibition officers to be able to break up these speakeasies or to break up the bootlegging rings. And so prohibition um, kind of you know, generated this disrespect for the law. It made an average citizen who 
you know, typically was a law-abiding citizen, now a criminal because they did not want to give up the consumption of alcohol. And this, in turn, is going to contribute to organized crime in many cities. Um, the era of people like Al Capone in Chicago, who was going to um, make a bootlegging empire that netted over $60 million a year. Uh, he took control of Chicago liquor businesses by getting rid of his competitors. And so he made the headlines you know, for um, gang attacks and gang killings. But what's going to bring Al Capone down is tax evasion. You know, the IRS is going to get Al Capone. So prohibition will eventually be repealed, but not until 1933 with the 21st Amendment. In the 1920s, we also see a changing role for women. Uh, women now had the right to vote with the 19th Amendment at the end of the suffrage era. And so with this brought a new sense of freedom. Uh, many young women started to embrace uh, their new emancipated lifestyle as they saw that they were emancipated from the traditions of their mothers with their right to vote. Um, so they embraced new fashions and new urban attitudes. You know, close uh, fitting felt hats, um, bright waistless dresses which were an inch above the knee, skin tone silk stockings, uh, sleek pumps and string bags of beads. These are all the fashions of what became known as the flapper. Um, so they were far more rebellious, a little less conservative, um, and they were assertive. You know, they wanted their equal status within society. Um, so many women began smoking, they started to drink in public, and, you know, this in turn, you know, brought some, la some backlash uh, towards young women. So many women were not flappers, you know, not all young women embraced the flapper lifestyle of the 1920s. But many women are going to embrace this new sense of freedom and start to work in professions outside the home. Um, so they became teachers and uh, nurses. With this also brought some change in you know, family life. You know, the social and economic changes started to reshape the way you know, families lived in the 1920s. The birth rate had started to decline and it had dropped slightly faster in the 1920s. A lot of this was due to wider availability of birth control, um, but also just families, you know, women working outside the home, not necessarily needing or wanting as much responsibility when it came to raising a family. And so many people, you know, the new innovations and new ten, uh, institutions had effect on freeing homemakers from some of their traditional family responsibilities. Many middle class housewives um, were the main shoppers and money managers, they started to focus their attention um, on other things. And so, you know, this is going to impact the overall birth rate. In the 1920s, we also see a rise in some new cultural music. So this is the quote jazz age. Um, so it's an, Amer an American born music that evolved, you know, ragtime music, a little bit of classical, but also the blues. Um, became popular at this time. So some key musicians, we got George Gershwin there with Rhapsody in Blue. Um, he blended classical music with jazz to kind of give it, you know, an upbeat tempo. He's going to be a major composer for Broadway. Um, such blues singers as Bessie Smith is going to take tours all across the country, um, singing Duke Ellington out of Washington, D.C. Um, people also like Louis Armstrong. So this new music craze is going to hit the general public and it's going to be played in speakeasies and it was, you know, it's in essence the life of a good time. Um, this also emerges the era of the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem Renaissance focused on African American culture, so their literature, their artistics. Um, so this is the age Langston Hughes was an African American poet during the 1920s. Um, images of the Great Migration, you know, leaving the South, the Jim Crow era, embracing African American culture. So some artists such as Jacob Lawrence uh, painting the Great Migration are going to be uh, remnants of life in the 1920s. And so Harlem became this mecca of African American culture in the United States. So again, kind of going on some of those artists and the flourishing of literature at the time. You know, after World War I, American writers flourished. Um, they became, this became one of the um, greatest uh, literary eras in American history. But it wasn't necessarily glorifying the United States. Uh, many writers be, uh, grew disillusioned. They weren't happy with the materialistic side of American society, and they thought the many Americans had lost their essence of humanity um, and their connection 
with their community and against perhaps some of those fundamentalist beliefs. Um, so many, you know, start to criticize the American public. You know, the great um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and the great Gatsby, you know, looking at the upper elite and the role of materialism. He's actually the person who coined the phrase the jazz age. Um, I mentioned Langston Hughes talking about the struggles of African Americans. Ernest Hemingway um, looking at, you know, trying to make war, not, not to glorify war, but really speak to the atrocities and problems of war at the time. So many writers did, from American society, did start to move to Europe as they became more um, upset with how society was starting to change in the United States. Um, but Harlem and Greenwich Village in New York City are going to be some of the two major magnets for the literary community in the U.S. 1920s, you know, with more people having, you know, time away from home, less working hours, this does create time for leisure, for entertainment, and sports is going to be one of those areas that people start to be drawn to. You know, the glories of baseball and Babe Ruth, the boxing era, horse racing, um, all of these are going to be some of the key um, sports in the 1920s that are going to draw fans in. You know, people would listen to the baseball games on the radio or they'd listen to the boxing matches. You'd want to go to the garden, you know, Madison Square Garden in New York City for a boxing match or go watch Babe Ruth and the Yankees. So these are all instances where people, again, have a little extra income, they have free time, and so they're looking for sources of entertainment. As mentioned before, with the consumer society, we do see an increase in technology. The radio is going to emerge as a news source of entertainment and information, uh, so a media outlet for the American public. Um, it was the most powerful form of communication in the 1920s. Everybody wanted to have a radio. The first major radio broadcast was actually Harding's um, election in 1920. And so his victory is going to be broadcast across the radio. And people start to use it for information. Like that was your source of entertainment. They had radio shows like Amos and Andy where, you know, you felt like this whole show was going on. They had this whole group of people in the background and all of these different instruments to make all this noise to sound like thunder and rain and like things were truly happening, even though they're in a little radio studio. Um, so there's Amos and Andy, there was Little Orphan Annie and the Lone Ranger, so children had their radio shows that they would turn into in the evenings, um, and there were, you know, the adult comedies like Amos and Andy and just general news broadcasts. But radio also created a new outlet for advertising. You know, many companies started to hire psychologists to not appeal to people like of products, but how they could, you know, use marketing to get people to buy things, things that they don't necessarily need. Um, and so this is the era of the new appliances that are coming in. So you've got a picture here of an electric um, refrigerator, which many people still refer to as the icebox. And the little silver item there in the bottom right corner is the first electric toaster. In the 1920s and even during World War One, we talked about the dogfights of World War One and how aviation played a role, if you remember the Red Baron there. But in the 1920s, we're going to see aviation continue to expand. Charles Lindbergh, pictured there at the bottom left, in 1927, he became the first person to conduct a solo flight nonstop across the Atlantic, which started to show how far uh, these planes could go and it's going to really pump a lot of investment and research into the aviation industry. Amelia Earhart's going to be the first female to do a solo flight across the Atlantic and the first transatlantic passenger flights are going to begin in the 1920s. So people starting to not having to travel by ship but maybe perhaps travel by air. And so to round out the 1920s is looking at the election of 1928. So Calvin Coolidge Silent Cal decided not to run again for president, which opened up the Republican Party's nomination. They looked to Herbert Hoover. He was very popular with his success during World War I, and he was also very popular with his success as Secretary of Commerce under the Harding administration and even Cal Calvin Coolidge's administration. So he is running also on the docket that, you know, the American public had found a lot of success with the Republican Party. Life was good. Business was booming. People were making a great deal of money. And so Harding didn't have to do a lot to advertise to get people to support um, him as president. He's going to be running against the Democratic nomination of Al Smith. 
Al Smith was our first uh, Roman Catholic candidate to be nominated, which is not going to be very popular during this time with the native sentiment as well as the rise of um, the Ku Klux Klan and targeting of Roman Catholics. But because of that tremendous prosperity of Coolidge's presidency in the Republican Party, as you can see from the election map there, Hoover had a landslide victory um, within the United States to win the 1928 election. And you know, when he was campaigning, he talked about the prosperity of the United States, and many Americans believed um, Hoover's quote when he said, we in America are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before. And so he truly did believe that. He thought the United States was about to triumph over poverty, that our economy was doing so well that poverty would no longer be an issue in the United States. And of course, as we'll see in 1929, things are going to start to come crashing down after Black Tuesday and the stock market crash, which is going to be the beginnings of the Great Depression.